Mr. McCoy back with part seven of Zulu Dog. Vusi runs off to collect the rat and throw it deep into the bush for some scavenging animal to find and devour. His heart is light. Mrs. Sithole did not say Gillette could not stay at the school, but neither did she order him to take the dog away. Vusi knows that that is her way of giving permission. The school consists of just two classrooms, one for each teacher. After he has thrown the rat away, Vusi rushes into Agnes's class. Because he is the last one in, there are no empty desks. He has to join some of the other children who are sitting on the floor, their books out in front of them. About 40 children, ranging in age from 6 to 12, are crammed into the room. Several windows are broken, and when it rains, the roof leaks in two places. Agnes has already started the class when Vusi comes in. He sinks down on a spot near the open door so he can sneak glances at Gillette, who is back in his stay position under a shade tree. Somebody tell Vusi, the rat catcher, what he has missed. The class titters at the label their teacher has given Vusi. One boy, sitting in back, raises his hand. Yes, Richard. We were learning about Bombada, madam. Yes, and who was he? He was a great Zulu chief like Sheka. He was always fighting. He led a rebellion, yes. Against whom was the rebellion? The whites. The British, Richard. The British. They came to Zululand 200 years ago by sea and landed on the coast. Slowly they moved inland, farther and farther. As they moved, they took the land from the Zulus. They pushed the Zulus into a smaller and smaller area. The teacher pauses, gazing around the room to see that everyone is paying attention. Vusi, what do you think happened next? The boy gives a startled gasp. He had been craning his head around to see what Gillette was doing. Um, um, I don't know, Mrs. Sithole. What was I talking about? Vusi hesitates. Chief Bam Bam? Bambada, Bambada. He was one of the greatest Zulus, and you can't even remember his name. You must look at me, not at that dog. If you look out the door once more, you will go straight home and take that dog with you, and that dog will never be allowed near here again. Do you understand? Yes, Mrs. Sithole. Sorry, Mrs. Sithole. So, to return to the lesson, 100 years ago, the British started making us, the Zulus, pay taxes to them. No one could afford these taxes. There was much dissatisfaction, so in 1906, Bambada led a rebellion against the British. She pauses again and repeats, Vusi, what do you think happened next? He is ready this time. Bambada must have lost the rebellion because the Zulus are still poor. We still pay taxes, and we do not have enough land. Vusi has often heard his father complain about land and taxes. Yes, we still pay taxes, but now we pay them to a government that we voted for, so that's all right. We have to pay taxes to the government so that they have enough money for hospitals, roads, salaries, and schools. Agnes looks around the classroom with its peeling paint, missing panes, and dilapidated desks, and frowns. Not much government spending has reached Masinga, she thinks. The education budget is all spent in the cities where the children of the government officials go to school. The people in the countryside have to make do with what's left over, if anything. You are right, Bambada lost the rebellion. His men were armed with sticks, oxhide shields, and spears. The British troops had guns. It was no contest. That is why we live as we do today. The Zulus all pushed on to small parcels of land, while the whites, who are descended from the British settlers, have big farms. Lucy ponders this. But man, my father says that we won our country back in 1994 when we voted for President Mandia. He says we are not ruled by the whites anymore, that they cannot order us around like they used to when there was apartheid. That's true. South Africa is a democracy now. We have a majority rule. But the question of who owns the land has not been settled. If you take something by force, do you have the right to claim it as your own? Do you have the right to say later, as the white farmers do, yes, you can have the land back, but you must pay for it. When we blacks are too poor, Agnes's voice is growing heated. It's taking us a long time to fix all the problems created by the white conquest of our country all those hundreds of years ago, and by apartheid. So what does this part of the story have to do with the story of Shirley and her family, 
How is that related to the situation with Vusi in his classroom and his family? Share with your fellow listener. Walter Nagugu drives through the outskirts of Tagula Ferry, a hamlet of perhaps a hundred shacks, a dozen shops, a post office, and a police station strung out along one of the few paved highways through this part of Zululand. Many years ago, it was a thriving trading post that owed its importance to the river ferry, which at the time was one of the few means for travelers to cross the Tugela. But the ferry is long gone. There are plenty of bridges across the river, and the hamlet has retreated back into obscurity. Walter stops his van at the taxi rank, and the waiting crowd jostles to climb in. The van is licensed to carry four passengers, but Walter lets 18 people on board before he closes the door and pulls off on the 90-minute ride to Peter Matzenberg, the nearest big city. The more people he can squeeze in, the more money he makes in fares. He knows most of his passengers. They ride into the city every day to their jobs because there is no work in Tukula Ferry or its surroundings where the only honest living to be made is from subsistence farming with vegetables and goats. Deep in the remote valleys and high on the inaccessible mountainsides, some Zulus grow marijuana, known locally as daga, which they sell in Piermatzenburg or farther afield in Durban or Johannesburg. Sometimes police aircraft fly over the plantation spraying herbicide, but generally they leave this lawless area to itself. There's lots of money in marijuana, but Walter is not interested. The trade is run by hard men, criminals who think nothing of eliminating their competitors. To eliminate in this part of the world means to kill. So how are things today, Mandala? Walter asks over his shoulder to the man in the seat behind him, Shadrach Buthesila, as the taxi enters the open country outside Tagela Ferry. We are suffering, brother. We are suffering. Vasella's lined face is propped on the walking stick he holds between his knees. Every day, the price of gasoline and food goes up, but my wages stay the same. On the radio, I hear talk about recession and inflation. What are these things, brother? Recession and inflation. They are killing me. Oh, I know, I know. Look at the price of gasoline. It is sky high now, sky high. This trip, for example. After I have paid for the gasoline, maybe I'll have a profit of 30 or 40 rand from fares. 40 rand for a 90-minute journey. That is nothing. Nothing. We are working like slaves. Walter shakes his head in despair. You know what I'm thinking. Bathsula leans forward and lowers his voice. I'm thinking I might take some Daga into Pierre Marzelberg to sell. That's the only way to beat this recession monster. No, Mandala, no, don't do that. If you get caught, you will go to jail. If you don't get caught, you get into trouble anyway. The people involved with that are very evil. They are greedy. Walter pauses to shift gears, and the engine tone changes as the Toyota strange up the start of a long, curving hill. He continues, Greed makes people rotten, Mandala. I know, because it is happening with the taxis. Up to now, we taxi drivers in Tagula Ferry have worked together well. We don't steal passengers from each other. We know each other. We trust each other. We are almost like family. The taxi has no air conditioning, and the early summer heat is building inside the crowded van. Walter rolls down his window to let in the breeze. But now strangers are coming in. Maybe you have seen them. They come from Peter Matzenberg and try to take our passengers. It's not good, Mandala. There are not enough passengers for the taxi drivers already in Tugela Ferry. If more taxis come from Peter Matzenberg, then we will really starve. All because some people are too greedy. Walter shakes his head. It's getting worse. The Peter Matzenberg drivers are threatening us. They say we must find other routes to work, and if we don't... Walter extends his index finger in imitation of a gun, and he points at his own head. The taxi is passing through the outlying suburbs of the city now. Traffic officer steps into the road ahead and signals the vehicle to pull over. Walter curses under his breath as he complies. The officer walks slowly around the taxi, looking carefully through the dust-caked windows. He comes back to stand beside the driver's door. You have a lot of passengers today? Yes, quite a few. I did not count them. I can see 18. That's four too many. 
Walter just sighs and doesn't bother to reply. You know, I should give you a big fine. I should write out a ticket, 50 rand for every passenger over the limit. That's 200 rand. Walter gives the officer a tired smile. He has been through this procedure many times before. Don't go to all the trouble of writing a ticket, officer. Let me just give you cash now. He hands the policeman a 20 rand note. Okay? The traffic officer folds the note and tucks it into his pocket. Drive safely, he says, smirking. What is your opinion about what Walter did to get the police officer to leave? Share with your fellow listener. On his second return trip of the day from Peter Mutzelberg, Walter has only eight passengers. Barely enough to pay for gasoline. The bribe he had to pay the traffic officer means he will probably not make any money today at all. Petrus could not find a job. He trudged around the city for hours, but everywhere the story was the same. No work. Walter is in a foul mood, roughly slamming the van into high gear for the long, straight, downhill stretch into Tequila Ferry. He barely notices the car in his rearview mirror until it starts to overtake him at high speed. Fool! He shouts across at the car, though he knows the driver cannot hear him. It is a BMW, not a recent model, but much faster than his taxi. The car stays level with the taxi. Walter looks again to see what the driver is playing at. He cannot see through the tinted windows of the black BMW, but then the passenger side window is lowered and a gun muzzle is thrust out. The passengers in the taxi see the gun and scream. Walter slams on his brakes and the van swerves off the road. Miraculously, it remains upright as it comes to a stop, the front fender resting against a tree. Walter and the passengers tumble out the door in shock, but unharmed. The passengers hold on to each other for support, their hearts beating wildly, their breath coming in deep gulps. They raise their voices, talking rapidly and loudly as if this will purge their stress. The babble subsides and coalesces into one question. Who were those people? Who were they? Walter stands alone bowed, silently contemplating his damaged Toyota and the flat tire, already wondering where he can borrow money for the repairs. He knows who the men in the BMW were. Rival taxi drivers from the city. The four dogs of the Ndugugu crawl are on their feet, tails sweeping from side to side, ears lifted. Spear and Beauty make mock grabs for each other's throats, then shake their coats as if trying to release the tension building inside them. The dogs have read the signs. It's hunting time. Two days after the taxi was forced off the road, Walter and Petra stand outside the kitchen hut in the twilight, tapping their legs with the ends of their homemade spears. The weapons are about three feet long, smooth teak sticks tipped with sharp metal points. Walter has a long knife in his belt. Both hunters are unusually nervous, and they wear antelope skin amulets to ensure that their dead ancestors will watch over them in the dangerous enterprise that they are about to undertake. Prudence emerges from the kitchen, carrying enamel mugs of steaming coffee for her husband and son. They take them gratefully, warming their hands against the hot mugs in the evening chill. Do you really have to do this, Walter? What choice to is there, wife? Without the van, I cannot work. To fix the van, I need 800 rand. Where will I get that money? Only one place. Walter takes a gulp of coffee so he does not have to meet his wife's angry eyes. You say you don't want to sell Daga because it's a crime. Well, this is also a crime. Look how rich the white farmers are. Look how many cattle they have. Look how many we have. Do not forget, this was all our land once. Walter's hand sweeps across the horizon. Then the settlers came and took it from us at gunpoint. If they can take our whole country by force, why can't I take one or two of their cows? They have so many. They won't even miss them. But it's dangerous, Walter. What will I do if I lose my husband and my eldest son? Don't worry, mother. We will both come back, Petrus assures her. We will bring two fat cows. We can eat good meat again. Walter and Petrus drain their mugs, whistle to the dogs, and set off with them into the bush. The men are barely out of sight of the crawl when they hear the sound of a small creature hurrying toward them. Strangely, the dogs ignore the sound as if there was no concern, but the men turn with their spears, ready. What do you think is happening? 
share with your fellow listener. And now, seconds more of Zulu Dog. It's me, Father. It's me. Boosie emerges from the trees, Gillette at his heels. Please, Father, can I come with you? I'm old enough now to hunt. I'm 12. And look, I have a dog. We'll find out what happens next as Zulu Dog continues. <laughs> <laughs>